Well, welcome everybody. Delighted you could join us tonight. My name is Dan Ryan. I'm director of the program, of the BI program, and I'm accompanied tonight by our program's registrar and program assistant, Judy Gia. You see her picture in the middle. And a second year BI student and uh, our uh, sort of social media whiz, uh, Shaina Hui. And you'll hear from both of them as we go through the evening. But before we get into the uh, substance of the presentation, um, I think it makes sense to go around the room and, and, and hear from folks. We find that one of the most special things about the Bachelor of Information program um, is not really its content, um, but it's the people who make it up. And so I think giving you a, sen giving you a, sen a chance to get a sense of who else uh, is, is checking, it, checking the program out um, is as good a way of get getting a sense of whether you'd enjoy the program, whether it's the program for you um, as, as there could be. So um, I've created this little uh, image of what it's like to be in our classrooms. Uh, these, are, uh, these are folks in one of the design thinking classes that I teach. Um, and um, I'm just gonna point at various people and their name will show up. Tell us where you're calling from, where are you tonight? Uh, what your name is, um, how'd you find out about the BI? And um, maybe what's on your summer reading list or your summer study list if you're taking classes. So let's see uh, who's here. Great, okay, so um, I think we've heard from everybody who's here. Um, I'm gonna jump into uh, giving you uh, a little bit of background on the BI. Uh, what, what the, where the program came from, what it's for, what it's shaped like, and so on. And we'll get a chance to hear from Shaina along the way about the student experience. Uh, and then we'll hear from Judy about the admissions process and what it takes to get accepted and so on. Um, so let's start out with the Faculty of Information. Uh, our motto is we study information. But what does that mean? Um, we study how information is generated, how it's created, um, how it's exchanged and how it moves around the world, uh, how it's transformed and combined with other information and other contexts to create knowledge, um, and how it's deployed to shape and guide the world that we live in. So, it's kind of like to say that you study information is a bit like um, there's an aspect of it of saying we study everything. In our faculty, you'll find people who study information that's stored in books. You'll find people who think of information uh, as stuff that's stored in could be ancient artifacts. It could be digital archives or multimedia archives. Um, we were interested in what people do with information on the blockchain or how artificial intelligence changes the way that we think about information. All of these things kind of fit under this very broad term um, that we, we use human information behavior. So what, is, what, are, what are the aspects of human behavior ranging from the very intimate and individual level of memory and storytelling and dialogue between individuals, all the way up to things on the very macro global scale as to how uh, science works, how information flows uh, in global markets and so on. You can hear me rustling my pages as I, as I turn my notes here. Um, so where did, it, where did all this come from? About five years ago, um, colleagues of mine began to realize that, that the stuff that we study at the Faculty of Information, the things I just described in a very general sense, um, the, and the interdisciplinary way that we do it, the, the Faculty of Information is one of the most interdisciplinary faculties in the university, um, that those two things are, are too important and too relevant 
to exclude undergraduates. The Faculty of Information has traditionally been a master's and PhD only faculty. And what my colleagues started to think was, you know, we're, we're, we're now living in an age where um, perhaps reserving this material for graduate students is not, is not appropriate. But the challenge comes because most undergraduate degrees are rooted in either disciplines or departments, or an occasion, you know, a pairing of departments. Um, but the problems of the real world, uh, problems, I, I call them the problems worth solving, problems worth dedicating your life to solving, um, those problems don't really care about disciplinary boundaries. To produce the kind of graduates who can tackle those problems, those problems like sustainability, like the future of democracy, the future of capitalism, um, to produce the kind of graduates who can tackle those problems, not only is interdisciplinary uh, thinking and interdisciplinary education um, doable and practical, it's, it's practically essential. And so that realization um, spurred my colleagues to say, let's think about how we could design a program that um, that would be for undergraduates, and, and it would just from the get-go strike a different note and, and be organized in a different way. And so one of the primary ways that it's organized differently is that it's a second entry program. So it works for the third and fourth year of a four-year university plan, or uh, you can already have earned a bachelor's degree and you're coming back and entering just for the two years so you're getting essentially a second bachelor's degree. That makes sense because the interdisciplinarity that we're building on um, allows us to draw students who've majored in anything in the university. And we'll talk in a few minutes about some of the things that those are. So talking about um, studying information sounds kind of cool, right? It's, uh, it's a great little phrase, but, but you might ask, um, Really, 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 what does it mean? Um, and why does it matter? Uh, and then how do we do it? What's it gonna look like? And that's what we're gonna try to kind of walk you through in the next few slides here. So why does it matter? Um, information is a part of pretty much every single big challenge in our time. Think about misinformation, data-driven public policy, inequality, privacy, globalization, right? To solve problems like this, it's going to take innovative and knowledgeable professionals, people who can work across disciplinary and professional and cultural boundaries, right? So, so the thing that we're doing, the interdisciplinary approach to education, um, and to sort of can't say this enough, right? Is is not just a it's not just a an aspect of the program. It's it's core to what we're up to because we're trying to produce a new kind of professional. And the way that we do it is integrating knowledge and skills from design thinking, from critical scholarship, from technical training, and experiential learning. And we put those together um, all at once, right? So you're, you're studying these things all at the same time um, with the idea that, that we're gonna forge a new kind of professional. What we're, what we're trying to recruit are people who are willing to do the hard work that it takes to become competent and conversant in multiple fields. Right, to, to study things ranging from critical social science to humanities, to computer software, to hardware. Um, people who are as comfortable talking in a community meeting um, about homelessness, say, um, or in a meeting uh, with engineers talking about, say, animal facial recognition. And, and both of these, are, I use those references because I, I uh, spent time with students in this past year who were doing those two things. 
So, so the long story short, like, like I'm trying to make the case here that the world needs BI graduates. Um, and and the, the spoiler is already out there. I said, I brought a guest speaker in to, um, to, uh, to ba back up what I'm saying here. So um, don't take my word for it. Um, listen to what President Obama has to say. It's fair to say then that some of the current challenges we face are inherent to a fully connected world. But not all problems we're seeing now are an inevitable project or an inevitable byproduct of this new technology. They're also the result of very specific choices made by the companies that have come to dominate the internet generally and social media platforms in particular. Decisions that intentionally or not have made democracies more vulnerable. 20 years ago, the pillars of web search were comprehensiveness, relevance, speed. But with the rise of social media and the need to better understand people's online behavior, in order to sell more advertising, companies wanted to collect more data, more companies optimized for personalization, engagement, and speed. And unfortunately, it turns out that inflammatory, polarizing content attracts and engages. So this was a speech that Obama gave at Stanford University a few weeks ago. I happened to miss seeing him by about two days, uh, unfortunately. Um, but it's a, it's a great speech. Uh, the, the too long didn't read version is this stuff matters, the stuff we're talking about in the BI. Um, but I, I, if you get a chance, uh, search out the speech and listen to the whole thing. It's, a, it's perhaps a half hour long, um, but he, he totally nails the, uh, the challenge of uh, figuring out new ways to regulate technology and, and social media. Uh, and AI. Um, you may have also seen um, headlines like this one the last few weeks. And you may have noticed that pretty much everybody, at least for a little while, had a very strong opinion one way or another about whether this was a good thing. It was all about free speech this, open source that, content moderation, billions, private, public, investment, leverage, da 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 da. And that's an important conversation, but we could ask ourselves, what do we need to know about? What do we need to learn about if we're going to participate effectively and non-naively in conversations like this, in conversations about the future of public discourse on Twitter or regulation of social media and so on? Um, what kind of things do you need to learn in order to do that? Like you got to figure out some stuff about recommender systems. Um, what does it mean to optimize for engagement? Um, is, are there th other things you could optimize for? Um, how do you train a recommender system? Uh, what, how, what's reinforcement learning? How does that work? Um, could you train a system like Facebook or Twitter or TikTok um, rather than optimizing for clicks and views and engagement? Could it optimize for human well-being? What does regulation really mean? How do we understand what, how does regulation happen? What does that mean? Um, where does regulatory policy come from? How do human minds work? Like how, how, does, how does our cognitive apparatus interact with all of this technology? How do human communities work? How do human communities decide, make decisions? Um, is everything that we're seeing right now in technology um, is it really all brand new or have we been here before? Um, so uh, somebody mentioned reading a, a long you know, a history book over 500 years, right? That we have to spend some time learning that kind of history to, to make sure that we're not hoodwinked into thinking that, that the, some of the stuff that we're dealing with is the first time humans have ever wrapped their heads around something. Um, how do technology and culture interact? Okay, so these are, um, these are a whole bunch of things that 
um, if I want to participate in the contemporary conversation about stuff that matters, this is just a, a, just a tip of the iceberg of stuff that I kind of need to know about. And so we might ask, how do you figure this stuff out? How do you expose yourself to ideas and knowledge like this? How do you train yourself up in all of this stuff? What, what should you major in if you want to know about these things? I'm gonna say you should join the BI program. Um, but you might ask yourself, you might ask me, okay, uh, but how is the BI going to get me from where I am today to being able to be conversant about these sorts of things? So how are we gonna do that? Well, here's how we do it. First off, we have some amazing teachers. Rohan Alexander teaches our introductory data science course. Tegan Maharaj is our advanced data science, and Alan Gailey, Bianca DiPetro, Seamus Haney, Leslie Shade, Olivier St. Cyr, Fiorella Foscarini, Meher Eskenaz Canary, and Colin Furness. These are just some of the folks who you get to study with. And we've managed to kind of create a stable of really amazing teachers. Um, so that's sort of ingredient number one. That's how we do it. We've, we've, we've managed to find some folks who are just darn good teachers. The second thing is um, we're gonna expose you to some books, right? We're gonna, we're gonna curate some reading for you. Part of the reason I asked that question about what are you reading this summer? Um, this will sound funny, but every now and then in my life, I've had some time to slow down and really read a book. And every time I do it, I kind of sit back and I go, man, oh man, you can really learn a lot of stuff by reading a book, right? And it's sort of obvious that it's embarrassing that I feel so surprised at that sometimes. Um, but, uh, but that's part of what we're gonna do. Um, here are some of the books you might encounter in your first year. Uh, you may have heard of the book, Surveillance Capitalism. Human Compatible is a great book on the AI alignment problem. How do we make sure that uh, artificial intelligences do what we want? Uh, you'll learn Arduino programming and hardware in your very first semester. Um, you'll spend a lot of time looking at design stuff. Um, and so you'll learn about UX, UI, and so on. Um, you'll probably read this book, A People's History of Computing. And believe it or not, you'll read that in conjunction with this Arduino programming book because those go to the same course. Um, and then you'll learn some R programming and you'll learn a little bit about the way in which human-centered data science uh, is, uh, is something that has to be added to the idea of, of just talking about big data and machine learning in that. So, so that's the second ingredient, right? We're gonna read some good books together. And it turns out that um, having a set of readings curated for you, and you know this, you're in university, um, and, and reading them with you and your classmates um, is really one of the great, amazing privileges of being a student. Um, later in life, you don't get to do that. You don't get to read with other people as much, um, and it really does make a difference. Um, the third ingredient is your fellow students. Um, I'm very comfortable promising you that we are curating a marvelous set of classmates with whom and from whom you are going to be able to sit down and learn the stuff we've been talking about for the next two years. Um, and these folks after you graduate are going to be a core element of your professional and social networks. Um, and that's really what matters almost more than anything, right? When, you know, you, there's a tendency to, to look at education and think of it in terms of, um, but, you know, the student sitting in her chair and the teacher at the front of the room. And, and yes, there's a certain amount that goes back and forth on that channel. But the stuff that goes horizontally between classmates, I think is almost more important. Uh, and so the fact that we're, um, we're recruiting an amazing group of folks for you to study with is a big piece of it. Um, now, where do they come from? Uh, all Coming over. from a social sciences slash life sciences background, I didn't really formally have access to this type of interdisciplinary space. Like I have friends in computer science, I have friends in just 
pure like media studies social sciences and the fact that it brings everything together I think is really valuable. This program kind of really nicely merged all of those interests like with social sciences, technology, and the intersection between the two. I hate it when schools separate students from arts and science because arts and science are kind of interrelated with each other. So as soon as I found this BI program, I feel like it's a really interdisciplinary program. So the reason I chose BI was because of the 10 lecture-based courses, but more importantly, the five studio-based courses, applying the theoretical knowledge that we learn in practicals and tutorials. I learned about this program and I was like, okay, in this program, they will teach me the basic skills that I will need in my career path. Okay, um, so that's our some of our uh, students from last year recorded. Um, but uh, why don't we hear from a real live current student? Um, and so if I could pass the baton to Shina for a few slides. Hi, um, can you hear me? We good? Yep. Okay, um, just a little background about me. Um, I'm a first. I'm now a second year BI student. I, I just finished my first year in the program. Um, I did finish a full degree at the University of Toronto in 2020. So I studied anthropology and history before that, uh, taking a year off. And then I kind of reapplied uh, last year into the BI program. And so one of the main reasons for that is because I recently wanted to pivot towards more into the field of UX because it kind of really bridged my passion for answering really meaningful questions about humans, but with technology, which is so extremely important today, um, and we're surrounded by it. So kind of allowing me to kind of take my background in anthropology and all these concepts and theories into a more um, practical environment, as well as kind of getting those foundational skills so I'll be able to apply for jobs was um, something that really drew me to the program. Um, the other big thing is the practicum, which we'll talk about more in detail later, um, but kind of getting that work experience and that hands-on um, experience was really important to me because I think that's really valuable and I'll learn a lot kind of being in, immersed in those environments. Um, from a student standpoint, the program has been a really refreshing experience, I think. So because I did my previous degree at the university, I know what kind of lectures are like when you're just sitting in a room with hundreds of students and you're just listening to a lecture, a professor lecture at you. Um, and you kind of get the opposite in this program where you kind of get to have really hands-on studios. So we, um, Dan briefly talked about it, but we have a course called How to Build a Computer where we're kind of working with Arduino kits and sitting in like um, studio spaces where you're interacting with your classmates, which is really nice. But that still contrasts with those traditional lecture materials where you can kind of get the like humanities background that some people may be used to and some people won't. Um, we learn kind of about archives and museums from a cultural perspective. And then we also kind of touch on society and culture and how those shape technology, which kind of helps you get a really well-rounded perspective. So you're not just too focused on the technical, but you have kind of the back, um, like the background to kind of support that. Um, some hard kind of softwares that we use in programs in the first year, at least, uh, we did Arduino kits. We did our studio for stats. We did some intro to JavaScript for more of the design kind of aspect. We used a little bit of Balsamic, we used Figma and we used Mural as well. So you kind of get a little bit, a little bit of a touch on kind of all these different um, kind of softwares and programs that you will interact with in whatever career path you'll um, choose to. But that even if you're see, for myself, I'm kind of like gravitating towards UX, but having that technical kind of background in programming is very important because I'm going to be kind of interacting with other teams within companies and having just that little bit of knowledge kind of has a really benefit to like other people that might just have a UX background. Um, uh, and that's were those, cool. were those hard? Like, um, <laughs> go, you know, coming from a history major and anthropology yeah. major to doing coding and things um, that yeah. seems kind of daunting. Yeah. So it can seem very intimidating and overwhelming. Um, especially for me, because I've just been sitting in lectures and writing papers for the last four years. Um, and so kind of jumping into this whole environment where like, oh, like I need to program, I need to kind of play with wires and circuits. Um, I will say that you can come into this with zero experience. Some of you guys may have experience and that will be great. 
Um, but you'll find that these kind of courses give you those foundational skills and the professors kind of expect you to have no experience with these materials. So they really show you from the basics, from foundation, from the very, very, very beginning and kind of like lay that groundwork for you to kind of work on top of. So I had no experience with any of these softwares, any of these computer things before this year. And I successfully made it through. <laughs> So it's, it's doable. So it does seem like a very intimidating kind of aspect, but it is. And you have kind of a great support system because um, we are a cohort. And which that means is your class goes through like the whole day together. You have all your classes together. So you have all the same schedule. So you're going through the same thing together, same assignments, same projects, everything. So you have your support with your classmates and as well as it's a small class. So you get that personal Kind of relationship with your professors as well like you're not just a student number on their page they know you like on a name-to-name -name basis which is also super important and the professors know like you know, we, we all have the same students right and so we can also kind of do a bit of cross matching right and you know sometimes it'll be um just mentioning in one class what I know you've already, you've studied in another class. Um, but it can also be advising wise, right? Uh, um, hey, you know, uh, Shina's in my class and she said she's really interested in this. And, and I know that you, Professor so-and-so do this, you know, maybe you could connect about that. And then, so it kind of, there's like a whole advising loop that happens there. Okay. We should learn more about this curriculum thing we keep talking about. So let's take a look at what it's shaped like. So the BI curriculum. There's an equation that uh, that we can kind of lay out to sort of say, how, what, what do you build the BI out of? Um, the BI is equal to 10 lecture courses plus six studio courses plus one practicum and four elective courses. There's three different kinds of experiences there. Um, there are lectures, there are studios, there are practicum. Practicum means essentially an internship, uh, a work experience that's related to, to, your, to your studies. Um, and then your electives, which could be studios or they could be lectures. The lectures, if I can jump here. The lecture courses jump, draw on sociology and political science and anthropology and cultural studies and statistics and data science, computer science, economics, policy studies, museum studies, archival studies, organizational study. It's kind of all over the place. Um, and, and so over the course of two years, you really do get to kind of poke your nose in a whole bunch of areas, but it's not merely a Noah's Ark of topics um, because there's, a, there's sort of a logic to it. And, each of the courses makes some assumptions about what you know and what you've learned in previous courses. The studio courses cover design thinking, user interface and user experience design, we call UI and UX design, data visualization and coding. But let's unpack the equation a little bit and see what, what the actual courses Sorry, are here. I'm having trouble understanding right now. Please try a little later. That was Alexa deciding to poke her nose Sorry, in. Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding right now. Please try a little later. Hold on. So ironically, I just pulled the plug on Alexa. Um, one of the papers that uh, we talk about in one of my classes is a paper called The Off Switch Problem, which was authored, um, one of the authors was my older son. Um, and it's about the question of whether an artificial intelligence um, on recognizing that one of the obstacles to completing its task could be um, someone trying to unplug it. And so it might decide to disable that capacity. Um, but so far, apparently Alexa has not reach that stage, so we're safe. Um, so the, the lecture courses, um, we see some of the names here. Um, they're, we call them lecture courses, but um, they're actually structured a lot more like a seminar. Um, our, the, the classes typically are between 25 and um, say 25 to 40 students. 
Um, and you're, you know, you're spending time with a professor and you're getting to know each other and so on. Um, and so there's a lot more discussion here than, than in, a, in a typical lecture. Um, you can notice here that a lot of the courses, um, you can kind of read these as tech and something, right? So we've got tech and society, tech and culture, tech and power, uh, tech and the economy, um, tech and organizations, and so on. Um, two of the courses here are in data science. Um, this is Worlds Become Data and, um, and Data Analytics. Um, but they're, they're, they're still very hands-on. They're not, they're not strictly math classes. Um, so you could almost imagine thinking of them as studios or workshops. Uh, computational reasoning uh, course that I teach is a mixture of le uh, lecture and hands-on. Um, I sort of think of it as all the good stuff in computer science that's useful in places other than computer science. And uh, here are the studio classes. Um, two of them are explicitly in design, how to design and designing interactive systems. Uh, one's a coding course, that's a, in Python. Um, and then data visualization or info visualization is kind of a crossover um, because it's data science, but it's also a design course. So a, a lot of the, uh, the content of that course is really about visual design. Um, and then there's my favorite course, which is uh, the one that China mentioned and I'd mentioned before, how to build a computer and why. Um, instead of a textbook in that class, you actually, what you spend your, your sort of textbook money on is a kit that, you know, it's a box that contains wires and breadboards and LEDs and microcontrollers and switches and things like that. It's very cool. Now you can check uh, the syllabi out at this address. I'll put it in the chat if you'd like to um, have a, a look at it. So you can see here, um, just they'll scan past them very quickly. Um, but I encourage you to take a look online to see what, what the content of the courses actually looks like. How do we, whoops. now I'm supposed to say, if you're wondering what one of those studio classes look like, Sound effects, <laughs> courtesy of a kindergarten class I know. Um, the way the classes are laid out over the course of two years looks like this. We have uh, year one, uh, fall and winter semester. Uh, each of them has three lecture courses. Um, and then there's two studios in the fall and one in the winter. And then in the summer you have practicum uh, or internship. And we typically do one lecture course that's an online, we do it online even if COVID wasn't here because people are spread all over the place with doing their internships. Um, and then the second year we have a mixture of lectures and studios. Um, adding to that, we have um, two electives each semester. Those electives can be taken pretty much anywhere in the university. Uh, the great majority of them are actually taken in the Faculty of Information uh, selected from among our master's degree courses, which we reserve some seats for uh, our BI students. The whole thing gets pulled together in the winter of your second year in a capstone studio. Now the capstone is uh, an opportunity to put all of your, all the, all the things that you've learned in the program uh, to pull them together, to to come up with a project of your own choosing. So we sort of switch the mode from the, the professor giving you the assignment to the student deciding um, something they'd like to study in more depth. Um, sometimes these are team projects. Um, about half our students actually um, choose to, uh, instead of doing our capstone, to do one of the interdisciplinary capstones at U of T. Um, there's a, a set of those that are offered by the School of Cities, uh, another set by a uh, set that's offered by in engineering. Um, and these are typically multidisciplinary capstone full year client based experiences. So, so somebody's gone out and found a client, a, a, 
a professor has gone out and found a client who wants a project done. And then they kind of formulate that as a project that's going to require, say, one electrical engineer, one designer, one architect, one sociologist, and one psychologist. And, and then they recruit students into those roles and the students work as a team for a full year. So you have that option to do that. And essentially what you do is you use one of your lect electives in the uh, courses in the fall um, uh, to cover for that second course. Now, those four electives in the second year, um, as I said, you can have any course in the whole university uh, is open to that you can get you know you can that you can find a seat in and you have the prerequisites for this is the list of some of the ones that people have taken the last year or two um, you'll see a lot of them are INF courses that's the faculty of information um, and and so this is a real big variety of courses of master's degree courses that the undergraduates in our program have taken the idea with the electives um, you know, part of it was so that you didn't feel too constrained because as Shina said, this is a uh, cohort-based program where we, we take all of our courses together from day one. Um, and, and so most of the program is, uh, is required courses, right? One after another. And we know exactly what you're taking in the fall of the first year and the winter and so on. Um, and, but we were a bit nervous that that might feel too constraining. And so, so electives were added in to, to preserve some student choice. Um, but there's another reason that electives make sense. And that is that um, each person's BI should be unique. Um, you use the electives and you use the topic you choose for a capstone and you use the internship that you seek out in, for your practicum. Um, all of these allow you to craft your BI from amongst or, or on top of the skeleton of the required courses, right? So, so the electives are really a part of kind of customizing the program for you. But let's hear from some people who've done We're it. learning how to build a computer. It's one of my favorite courses because we're working with our genios. Design courses, we have courses on cultural imagination. We're learning about design through a human-computer interaction and user experience lens. We're able to actually create our own prototypes and design systems with those lenses in mind. Information policies and laws and Python coding course, information visualization. We're kind of like learning about the design process and like a big concept that we're talking about is adapting the design to people instead of having people to adapt to the design. We're at least exposed to a diverse range of technical tools and uh, logic and thought processes. Uh, but at the same time, we also learn about theory and you know critical approaches to design, uh, critical approaches, uh, about information and information sciences. The professors have kept the courses open-ended so you can go out there and explore whatever you want, which I really enjoy. Now, of course, there's more to an education than um, just the curriculum. Um, and here are some of the resources uh, and features that make the BI work, that kind of round out the curriculum uh, to make it work. First of all, the classes are small. This year, our classes had 25 students in them. Um, we anticipate next year, um, well, we, we are gonna stop at 50, so the classes will not be bigger than 50. Um, I would anticipate they'll be more like 40. Um, we'll, if, we, if we do get to the point of 50, we'll still probably split the studio classes to smaller groups of about 25. Um, we have access to an amazing set of facilities at the Faculty of Information, including maker spaces and design studios and labs. Um, there's a very strong student services team that is available for academic advising, for writing help, tech support. Um, and we have a really great and dedicated career services team that helps support uh, finding internships and um, uh, and practica and after, gradua after graduation placement. Of course, we can't leave out the fact that you'd be studying at Canada's number one university and one of the top universities in the world. 
and that the faculty of information within U of T is perhaps the fa fastest growing faculty. We've added multiple new faculty members each of the last few years and anticipate that that's going to continue. And finally, um, even though our program is young, uh, when you graduate, you'll be joining a group of about 7,000 iSchool alums who are in leadership positions literally around the world. Uh, and, and these folks, is, you know, that is the network into which you graduate. Um, these are the folks who've, uh, who's, who's, whose work has made uh, the words, I graduated from the I school at U of T kind of count for something. Um, there are people who you can go to for advice. There are people who can connect you with places that you might wanna uh, work or, um, or do research and so on. Now the, the career thing is, is an important piece for us. Um, this bachelor's degree is one that we consider to be a professional bachelor's degree. Um, and the curriculum and support services are kind of built around that idea. We're a very firm believer in the idea that the best learning happens when it involves doing and that that interplay between uh, of doing in a studio class um, and, the, and, and in internships with the thinking that happens in your lecture classes, um, thinking about big critical ideas and so on, um, that, that you are the nexus where that stuff is happening, right? That, that, that you're on Tuesday morning, you know, you're building circuits and thinking about the history of the building of computational machines. And on Tuesday afternoon, you're sitting there talking about um, global information policy. And, and you become the nexus of that interdisciplinarity, right? You're the person who has, has taken their mind in those two different directions. And, and we just really think that that is going to be a, an advantage in the working world that, um, that people really haven't even begun to appreciate how great that is. Here's some of the placements um, last summer and this summer. Um, as you see, this is a, a pretty amazing mix of private industry, uh, NGOs, non-government organizations, government organizations, um, as well as placements with um, uh, uh, doing research with U of T professors, which is, which is, which is one of the uh, channels that uh, some people uh, choose. Now, China has just started her curriculum, her, her practicum, um, and uh, it was Sun Life here was the last thing that popped up. Um, let me turn back over to her and just say, how was the process of getting to the internship and what's it been like so far? Yeah, um, so for applying to internships, it can be very kind of nerve wracking, especially if you're kind of pivoting into a new field that you don't necessarily have experience in, um, which is the same experience for a lot of your classmates. You'll find um, everyone isn't going to be going towards the same kind of career path as you because we all come from such different backgrounds and we have kind of different aspirations to where we wanna go. Um, that being said, there is a really big kind of support system around kind of the process into which you want to eventually end up with a summer kind of internship. And so one of the things is we have our practicum prep course, which is the INF 401 course. It is a full year course. And basically it will run from September up until the springtime. Um, and in that course, we kind of go into resume writing, cover letter writing, um, interviews. And so that kind of experience is really valuable because it runs when you're actually going to be applying for these jobs. And so learning about how to speak about yourself and telling your story is really important um, when you're applying and doing these interviews. And it's something that a lot of other programs won't really provide because of that. It's really like something you need to just kind of learn on your own, but kind of having a class where you get to practice that and kind of get tips on how to do that is really important. Um, the other thing is the Career Center, as Dan mentioned, there are kind of um, people there that 
can do mock interviews with you, which is really valuable. So because I've never done interviews in UX, so I was really nervous about that. And just having someone to kind of hear about how I would answer behavioral questions is really valuable because I think I'm doing a great job, but I might not necessarily be doing the greatest job. And so kind of getting even someone else to kind of sit there and listen to you talk about yourself is really important and kind of getting that feedback is also very valuable. They're also a really good resource are your professors. So going through all these courses, you'll kind of see which ones that will kind of pique your interest and maybe you want to pursue as a career. Talking to them, a lot of them have worked in industry before or have connections to people who have worked in industry and getting their insight is really important. So sitting, getting to sit with them, asking them what kind of questions you could prepare for, how you can uh, answer technical questions, if it's something new to you is really, really important. Um, and the last thing is kind of being very proactive and asking questions. Um, you really get kind of what you put into it with this process is like applying for any other job. It's going to be a very long and kind of tiring process and you will get rejections. And that's kind of the whole experience because we're in a bubble right now in school where it's okay if you fail because you're learning, but this is great experience for when you graduate and you're applying for real jobs. It's going to be very similar experience when you're kind of applying for all these jobs. So for me, the practical experience has been really good. Um, I got my bunch of rejections. I got my interview experience and kind of, I now know what I need to work on myself for when I'm applying to full-time jobs next year. I'm now in week three of my internship. I'm doing kind of a UX research and design role at Sun Life. Um, I am kind of remote slash hybrid, um, but it's been really cool to kind of see what you learn in theory in these classes kind of apply to a practical environment and kind of see how it works in industry. And so that's kind of very valuable for whatever kind of career path you're doing, whether you're in like data analytics, we have kind of co like people in my cohort that are in like Statistics Canada. So there's definitely people that will go towards different things. And it's really interesting to hear after that about all our varying experiences. What's one, um, like one takeaway from all of your interviews this year? Like, what are you gonna work on? I think one thing is, well, there's many things I should work on, but one thing is really important is um, knowing how to talk about myself and kind of presenting my story because um, your employers are interviewing so many people in a day and you need to have your brand and your story that will set you apart from other people. So whether that be like your passion or kind of something unique in your background, um, I think that's been really important and kind of a really valuable lesson. Also learning how to talk about what the BI is because it's always a question that employers will circle back to yeah. because it's, <laughs> it's so new and it's so unique, but they're very, very, very interested in. In all the interviews I've done, there's always been like a secondary follow-up question to like, so can you talk about like what the BI is again? Because that was really interesting. And so kind of like really playing that up um, has been, it's worked in my favor at least. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, <clears throat> you know, it turns out in education in general, um, uh, we talk about this thing sometimes called metacognition, which is sort of thinking about thinking or thinking about learning. Um, it's it's really one of the most important skills out there, and uh, and you know exactly that sort of thing. Like what? Let's you know, it's if you're a physics major, it's really easy never to really think about what it means to be a physics major because everybody kind of thinks they know, most people don't really know, but you sort of feel like you know. Um, whereas the BI forces you, right? You gotta say, yeah, what the hell is this thing? I mean, why are we doing all this stuff? What, why does this mix? And, and that, that reflective practitioner, reflective learner is, is really, um, it's almost like an accidental benefit in some ways. Okay, well, let's, um, let's, let me wrap up my little piece here by talking a bit about uh, careers in general. Um, what kind of careers do people pursue? Well, as we're a new program. So uh, our first graduates are just a year or so out and, and it was a, a very weird year as we all know. Um, so we don't have a long answer to the question of uh, what careers do people go into after a BI? Um, we're in the process of interviewing 
our first two cohorts of alums to, uh, to learn about their job market experiences. But here are some of the directions that people are headed in. Um, a, no, a number of these you'll notice are in UI, UX design in that general direction. Others are more analytical roles. So a business analyst, a privacy analyst, and so on. Um, some of our students aspire to be a, a web publisher, a web developer. Um, a number are attracted to uh, records and archives and, and other sort of uh, career tracks that are uh, related to the library science part of the iSchool. And then data science and its variants are something that's, uh, that's coming up a lot. Um, about 20% of the grads so far have opted to pursue a master's of information at the iSchool, an MI. Um, most of them, I think, are in UI UX uh, with a few in human-centered data science as their, as their concentration. Um, before I finish up, why don't we hear from a couple more I students? I always wanted to be a UX designer. And in this program, they will teach me the basic skills that I will need in my career path. I'm hoping to get into something with data science or artificial intelligence and anything within technology. So my career goal would be becoming a user engineer designer. Also really interested in exploring more in privacy studies as well. Uh, my career goals include being a UX designer, hopefully somewhere in product design. And I think my studio-based courses on design really um, help me prepare for that. I really also like to design and design and maybe create technology that helps me do better in my everyday life. I find it really difficult to organize my time, my information. So I'd also like to find a way to create that, those solutions for myself and the people around me. I hope to get involved in like policy and or like communications because I'm interested in kind of like looking at the systemic way things are done, how things can sort of be improved and like impacts can be made. So there are, there are best spokespersons. The next thing we're going to do is I'm going to turn the baton over to Judy. And what we'll hear about is the admissions process, um, uh, how, how to apply, how to get in, how to pay for it. Um, and then we'll circle back and have opportunity for a general Q&A with Shaina, Judy, and myself. So Judy, the floor is yours. but we don't hear you yet. Sorry about that. Hi everyone. Uh, I recognize most of your names uh, because I think we've corresponded on them. So it's great to see all of you here. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna get right into it and talk about admissions. Um, okay, so as Dan mentioned, and as all of you probably know, the BI is a second entry undergrad program. This means that you can enroll after two full years of university coursework or after you've completed a bachelor's degree in another field. This also means that we can't transfer credits in. So we simply require that you have completed 10 FCEs, which is U of T terminology and stands for full course equivalent, whereby one FCE is a full-time course that runs over a complete academic year. So the BI requires 10 FCEs or 20 semester length courses. At least four of those need to be at the 200 level or above. Applicants also need to have a 70% GPA in the last five FCEs. And in addition, because our curriculum is highly inter and multidisciplinary, and because we hit the ground running, so to speak, expecting the skills and experiences of an entering third year university student, we want to see that you've taken at least one course in each of these three areas. So the first is formal systems. And under this heading are science and math courses, logic, statistics, coding, uh, math. Um, so you need to know that you enjoy this kind of work and we need to know that you're ready to grapple with it. Sociocultural systems is where we look at courses in human society and we define this category very broadly. So topics such as sociology, anthropology, political science, media, or cultural studies can all work. 
And lastly, creative practice design understood broadly is an important dimension of our curriculum. And we'd like to see that you spend a little time in the pastures of design, art, performance, creative writing, film, etc. And we interpret this area quite broadly as well. So the purpose of these requirements, again, are to ensure that this is the right program for you. So now we'll talk about how to apply. So our application process is very simple. First, you need to establish an application through the OUAC portal. Then we need two or three supporting documents. So one of which is your transcript, which uh, can be unofficial so that we can verify eligibility. Second is a personal statement about why the program is right for you. And I'll talk about more, um, more about this in a minute. Lastly, if applicable, we need proof of your English proficiency. So all the documents should be sent as an email attachment to that website you see on the screen. Um, okay, so about supporting documents. So the personal statement, I'll just elaborate a little bit. We wanna hear how your previous experience, academic, work, social, personal, and your future plans makes you and the BI program a good fit. We look to see that you have a sense of what the program is about, what aspects of it are particularly attractive to you. We look to see what kinds of questions and issues you wanna explore while pursuing the BI and with the BI after you graduate. So what impact are you hoping to make in the world? How does the BI help you achieve it? There's no need to write a book. We prefer statements in the four to 500 word range. And however, the personal statement does not need to be a written essay. Use whatever medium allows you to best express yourself. Tell us who you are and communicate why the BI is the right program for you and vice versa. It can be a two minute video, a website, a portfolio, or pretty much anything so surprise us. So the bottom line is that your personal statement should successfully introduce you to us and help us evaluate the fit between you and the BI program. So uh, in terms of transcript explanation, so this is an optional item, but it gives you the opportunity to just kind of describe gaps in your transcript and talk about you know, what the gaps are and what caused those gaps. So the official record of any of our lives doesn't always give us a complete sense of the story. And this is certainly true of our academic transcripts where our school achievement is boiled down to a list of courses and a computated GPA. So we know that stuff happens in life and most of us have a semester or a year where the official record doesn't capture us in the best light without a little bit of explanation. So yeah, as I mentioned, if you have something in your transcript that doesn't show you in the best light, that's not a problem. Just include an explanation and we'll take that into con uh, consideration when we review your file. Okay, so next we'll just talk about deadlines. So you might be wondering when you can apply and you know, some of you have already corresponded with me and shown interest and that's great. Uh, but for those of you that have not applied yet or are contemplating, you can actually apply starting tonight uh, after the session. So our applications are open and we've actually extended our deadline from what you see on the screen, which is April 30th, um, 2021 <laughs> to um, June 30th, 2022. <laughs> So our current, our current deadline is June 30th, 2022, and we would like to receive supplementary materials um, at the latest by July 15th, 2022. So you don't have to wait. Um, you can apply as soon as possible. Do keep in mind that we evaluate on a rolling basis and we send out admissions offers promptly and we'll continue to do that until the class is full. Okay, so next I'll talk a little bit about tuition fees because um, that's very important. So just to give you a sense of numbers, full-time domestic tuition is about $1,300, sorry, $13,000. 
and full-time international tuition was about 62500 So whoever said you can't put a price on education was clearly misinformed. Um, but to offset the high tuition fees, um, we do offer awards and financial aid. So uh, we do have some admissions awards available through the Faculty of Information and the University of Toronto. Uh, the BI program offers admission awards up to $5,000. All applications are eligible, sorry, all applicants are eligible and considered. So you don't need to fill out a separate application. You will automatically be considered when you apply to the program. Uh, the university also has an extensive work study program, so you can apply online starting in August. And of course, government loans such as OSAP and personal bank lo loans are also available. So that's it from me. Um... And I think at this time, um, the floor is open for Q&A, so please ask away.